வணக்கம் வாட்ஸ் தேர் டு எக்ஸ்டென்ஸ் ஆர் டெண்டன் ரிப்பேர் ஜஸ்ட் சி தி எக்ஸ்டென்ஸ் ஆர் டெண்டன் சூச்சர் இட் அண்ட் தென் புட் அ பிஓபி அண்ட் இட்ஸ் ஓவர் இஸ் இன்ட் இட் ஆர் இஸ் இட் இட் இஸ் மச் மச் மோர் எவ்ரி சிங்கிள் ஜோன் ஆஃப் தி எக்ஸ்டென்ஸ் ஆர் டெண்டன் இன்ஜுரி ஹேஸ் இட்ஸ் ஓன் சிக்னிஃபிகன்ஸ் அண்ட் இட்ஸ் ஓன் சாலியன் ஃபீச்சர்ஸ் சம் ஆஃப் தம் வெரி இன்ட்ரெஸ்டிங் எஸ்பெஷலி இன் ஜோன் சிக்ஸ் செவன் எயிட் அண்ட் நைன் we'll see all those salient features in this video and also the surgical technique of suturing we'll see the different conditions in which the extensor tendons can get injured or ruptured and how to manage them this video will deal with extensor tendon injuries at zone 6 7 8 and 9 a zone 6 injury indicates injury to the extensor tendons on the dorsal aspect of the hand over the metacarpal bones repair of the extensor tendon injury at zone 6 usually have favorable prognosis because they are not associated with any joint injury there is increased subcutaneous tissues when compared to the fingers so there are less chance of adhesions there is more tendon excursion at this level so less limitation with any small adhesions core sutures are easily placed since the tendons are quite chunky at this level and finally dynamic splinting can be easily performed after repair at this level another point to remember with injuries to the extensor tendon at zone 6 is that even complete extensor lacerations may not result in metacarpophalangeal joint extensor lag because of the tethering effect of the juncture tendine connections that may hold the finger in extended position so if there is an extensor tendon injury here at this level the forces from the juncture tendine of the neighboring fingers may hold the finger in extension for some time there is just one more point to remember regarding the biomechanics of extensor tendon injury at this level sometimes an injury like this may look like there is an extensor injury and there may be an extensor lag and patient may not be able to extend the involved finger but the x-ray may show metacarpal fractures so the point to remember is that if there is an associated metacarpal fracture there may be an apparent shortening of the hand due to the angulation of the fractures and this may lead to what is known as an apparent extensor lag when an injury to the extensor tendon is diagnosed at this level surgical repair needs to be done it begins with an exploration and if less than 50% laceration is noted in the tendon the involved portion alone can be sutured with a 40 polypropylene suture if more than 50% laceration is noted it is repaired with core sutures of 30 polypropylene and may be reinforced with 50 polypropylene cross stitches following surgical repair splinting needs to be done which can be either static or dynamic static splinting consists of maintaining the wrist extension at 30 degrees to 45 degrees metacarpophalangeal joints kept at 20 degrees of flexion and interphalangeal joints kept free for active range of motion and this may be achieved with a below elbow volar pop slab this is generally the safer method of splinting dynamic splinting consists of a static splint being applied for one week after surgery and after that the dynamic splint is applied which keeps the wrist in extension and a dynamic rubber band traction brings about passive metacarpophalangeal joint extension and the patient has to do active metacarpophalangeal joint flexion against the pull of the rubber band this needs to be done about 10 times every hour this type of splinting gets better results but only if the patient is able to understand what is needed and does the therapy as advised not all extensor tendon injuries at zone 6 are seen in the acute situation sometimes they present in the chronic situation where they are tethered by the juncture tendine permitting even a delayed repair this may be done with a direct repair if the tendon ends are close by or intercalary tendon grafts or even staged tendon grafts if there is a gap between the ends of the cut tendon and if there has been some flap cover over the dorsum of the hand in that situation even a tendon transfer can be done to achieve extension of the fingers loss of extensor tendons in zone 6 is usually associated with the loss of skin also hence 
a skin reconstruction needs to be done first before the tendon reconstruction can be done. Both the skin and tendon reconstruction can be done together also. There are three main situations where we can get this type of extensor loss, trauma, infection and tumors. This is a patient with extensor loss and skin loss following trauma. The skin loss has been reconstructed with an abdominal flap and the extensor tendon deficit can be noted here. Reconstruction of the defects in the metacarpal bones was done with a vascularized double barrel fibula and the extensors were reconstructed with tendon grafts. This brought about good extension of the fingers at the metacarpophalangeal joints, enhancing the function of the hand. Diabetic infections on the dorsum of the hand with blistering of the forearm skin can also cause a loss of extensor tendons. Here, the reconstruction of the skin has been done with a skin flap and reconstruction of the extensor tendons done in a separate stage with tendon grafts from fascia lata. Tumors like the giant cell tumor of the bone can also involve the extensor tendon per se or may be involved after excision of the tumor. Finally, a rare condition known as secretans disorder which was described in 1901 by a Swiss insurance physician who described a condition characterized by a hard, sometimes cyanotic edema on the dorsal aspect of the hand, which is a self-inflicted condition, the patient intentionally causing signs and symptoms, which may mimic rheumatoid or neoplastic conditions. A below elbow cast will be useful, but it is important for the patient to be given psychotherapy so that he does not keep repeating it even after the cast has been removed. Surgery must be avoided in such patients. Now we shall consider extensor tendon injuries at zone 7. Zone 7 injury refers to injury to the extensor tendons under the extensor retinaculum, dorsal to the wrist joint and this being the unique feature of extensor tendon injury in this zone. That is the injured tendons lie under the extensor retinaculum which is a synovial line tunnel. So now certain questions come to our mind. Is the extensor retinaculum important? Can it be opened to access the extensor tendon? Can it be left open after the repair of the tendon? Or should it be repaired afterward? Will it cause bowstringing if not repaired? To get answers to all these questions, let us understand the dynamics of the extensor retinaculum. Studies have shown that even resection of the entire extensor retinaculum over the second dorsal compartment caused a minimal extensor lag, only 7 degrees and minimal bowstringing. However, resection of the entire extensor retinaculum over the fourth dorsal compartment led to massive extensor lag, almost 80 degrees and severe bowstringing to the tune of about 61 millimeters. So the lesson is avoid resection of the entire retinaculum over any of the dorsal compartments. What about partial resection of the extensor retinaculum? Can we do that to access the injured extensor tendon below? The study goes on to say that the distal portion of the retinaculum is most important in preventing extensor lag and bowstringing, especially for the fourth dorsal compartment. So, to access the injured extensor tendon under the extensor retinaculum, do not open the extensor retinacular ligament completely and do not open the distal portion of the retinaculum. Open only the proximal half of the extensor retinaculum to access the tendon. Though the extensor retinaculum, which is a sort of an extensor pulley for the extensor tendons, is similar to the flexor pulleys, they differ in many ways. In the flexor pulleys, there is severe bowstringing if there is a loss, but in the extensor pulleys, it is quite limited in some compartments. For the flexor pulleys, it is difficult to repair after access to the tendon. But for the extensor retinaculum, it is either easy to repair or reconstruct or can be left alone. Of course, the flexor pulleys are much tighter than the extensor retinaculum compartments. The next salient feature of extensor tendon injuries at zone 7 are that the cut tendons retract into the forearm. So to retrieve the proximal ends, we need to either make counter incisions in the forearm or extend the original wound. And this needs to be explained to the patient before taking up for surgery. This young manual laborer presented with a history of injuries to the left wrist sustained while working with a wood cutting machine. 
examination revealed that the extension of the wrist was weak there was no extension of the fingers but abduction of the thumb was possible at the metacarpophalangeal joint at the carpometacarpal joint he also had a numbness on the dorsum of the thumb web so clinically we made a diagnosis of injury to the extensor carpi radialis longus extensor carpi radialis brevis extensor pollicis longus edc to the fingers extensor indices proprius extensor digiti minimi and superficial branch of the radial nerve so now my marking is i'll make a flap over here skin flap over here proximally i will extend it like here most extensors are here so this much i will need if necessary i will extend it further the tunica is now raised now the extension incisions are made both distally and proximally and the skin flaps are raised just superficial to the deep fascia these flaps are anchored first with 30 polyamide suture now debridement of the wound is done any devitalized tissue crushed tissues foreign body contaminants are removed in this step now the tendons are identified one by one this is the extensor carpi radialis brevis and it is identified by its insertion at the base of the third metacarpal bone the distal cut end of the extensor carpi radialis longus is identified as it lies radial to the extensor carpi radialis brevis and it is seen to be inserted on the base of the second metacarpal bone now the distal cut end of the extensor pollicis longus tendon is identified and it is confirmed by pulling on the tendon and noting the extension at the interphalangeal joint we need to remember that we should support the wrist and the thumb while this movement is being tested now the proximal end of the now the proximal cut end of the extensor pollicis longus is identified by its exit from the distal end of the third dorsal compartment which lies just ulnar to the lister's tubercle on the radius bone now the superficial branch of the radial nerve is dissected this is the proximal end of the nerve and it is seen on the radial aspect of the lower end of the radius so here we can also confirm that the first dorsal compartment is completely intact on further dissection we can note that one branch of the superficial branch of the radial nerve is seen to be intact also now the distal cut end of the superficial branch of the radial nerve is also identified and we can see that both the proximal and distal ends have been dissected and kept ready now the distal cut ends to the extensors of fingers are identified that is the edc to the index finger this is the extensor indices proprius the edc to the mid finger and the edc to the ring finger and the edc to the little finger now the distal identified tendons are debrided this debridement consists of removal of the hematoma that surrounds the tendon and is entrapped within the paratenon of the tendons now the edc of the fingers and the eip have been freed from the hematoma the compartment of the extensor pollicis longus is explored to look for any injury to the muscle and the epl tendon is retrieved proximally the deep fascia is incised proximal to the fourth compartment and the extensor digitorum muscles are identified the hematoma is removed and the tendons are retrieved from the from under and the tendons are retrieved from under the extensor retinaculum since the hematoma seems to be extending proximally an extension of the incision is also made to access this and also find the extensor indices proprius muscle now the eip tendon and the muscle have been isolated and dissected this is important to ensure that the eip is repaired separately the proximal cut ends of the extensor digitorum communis tendons and the muscle are also dissected and kept ready so these are the edc tendons to the fingers and this is the eip tendon the fifth dorsal compartment muscle that is the extensor digiti minimi is also dissected and found to be intact 
This is confirmed by pulling on the muscle and noting the extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint of the little finger. The proximal cut end of the extensor pollicis longus tendon is now railroaded through the third dorsal compartment. By using a sterile catheter, here the tubing of the scalp vein set is used. In a similar fashion, by using the same tubing, the extensor digitorum communis tendons are railroaded through the fourth dorsal compartment space and after retrieval they are transfixed with a hypodermic needle. Now the muscles of the second dorsal compartment, the extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis are opened. Here you can see the tendons of the ECRL and ECRB. They are dissected and retrieved proximally. Sometimes there may be tendinous interconnections between the two tendons which are also separated. These tendons are now retrieved by passing a hemostat through the second dorsal compartment or under the extensor retinaculum. After retrieval, the tendon ends are transfixed with a needle. So now we have identified that the structures injured are the extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, EPL, EDC to the fingers and EIP tendons and the superficial branch of the radial nerve and only one branch of this nerve has been injured. And we have identified both the proximal and distal cut ends of these structures and so it is ready for repair. Now the tunica is released, hemostase is achieved and a thorough wash of the wound is done. Before repair, the edges of the cut tendons are prepared by making the ends sharp with a fresh number 11 blade. Now the repair of all the cut tendons is done by using 3-0 polypropylene with horizontal mattress sutures. The cut ends of the superficial branch of the radial nerve are repaired using epineural sutures with 8-0 polyamide suture material under loop magnification. The repair of all the injured tendons has been done and the repair of the nerve has also been done. It is now ready for skin suturing. The skin suturing has been done with no subcutaneous sutures. It is a direct skin closure with 3-0 polyamide suture using vertical mattress sutures. Bulky dressings are applied and immobilization protocol has been followed with a static below elbow volar POP slab keeping the wrist in 30 degrees of extension, metacarpophalangeal joints in 20 degrees of flexion and interphalangeal joints straight with another POP on the volar aspect of the thumb maintaining the interphalangeal joint of the thumb in neutral position. This POP is maintained for 3 weeks after which the POP is discarded and active mobilization along with scar massage is started. Extensor tendon injury at zone 7 may present in a chronic situation in three conditions. When there are underlying fractures in rheumatoid arthritis and in tuberculosis. In all these conditions there is an attrition and rupture of the tendons of course due to different causes. Even a non-displaced distal radius fracture may be associated with late rupture of the extensor pollicis longus tendon in zone 7. The possible causes of the EPL tendon rupture in this condition is quite hypothetical. It could be due to extravasation of blood or fracture debris into the tight third dorsal compartment which may constrict the extensor pollicis longus leading to attritional rupture or there may be a relative watershed zone of intrinsic vascular supply to the tendon beneath the extensor retinaculum which predisposes the tendon further to rupture. In rheumatoid arthritis, the incidence of extensor tendon rupture at the wrist is around 4% and prevalence of additional rupture of another tendon is more than 50%. Individual cases were reported in 1959 and later studies showed a prevalence of 1.6% of ruptured extensor digitae minimi tendon in rheumatoid wrists. Though this swelling looks like a typical dorsal wrist ganglion, the consistency was soft and boggy 
and exploration showed a synovial inflammation which was encompassing the extensor tendons and capable of causing attrition of the tendons and their rupture if not treated in time. In some parts of the world, tuberculosis can also cause attrition of the tendons and rupture. Though tuberculous tenosynovitis is a rare type of extrapulmonary tuberculosis, melon seed bodies are one of the typical features seen here. On the flexor side, we get the typical compound palmar ganglion, but on the extensor side, it usually presents as a granulomatous inflammation causing a swelling on the dorsal aspect of the wrist. And in this case, you can see the tendons being engulfed by this granulomatous inflammation. And the XI specimen also shows the melon seed bodies. The treatment of such ruptures of extensor tendons would be treatment of the underlying condition first and then appropriate tendon transfers. Usually the flexor carpi radialis is transferred to achieve extension of the fingers and the extensor indices proprius is transferred to the extensor pollicis longus tendon. Next we shall consider extensor tendon injuries at zone 8. Zone 8 represents injury to the extensor tendons in the distal third of the forearm. So the injury is at the level of the musculotendinous junctions. Consequently, repair in this zone depends on the tenuous holding power in the muscle tissue. If there is any problem in achieving a good suturing of the tendon at this level, a tendon transfer may be considered as an alternative option. So the repair and results of extensor tendon injuries in zone 8 depend on the ability to achieve a good suturing of the tendons at the musculotendinous junctions. We do come across some rare situations of chronic musculotendinous junction closed ruptures of the extensor tendons. These may occur as a consequence of violent resisted wrist or finger extension in tendons that have already undergone attrition due to the diseases that have been mentioned earlier on in this video. The EDC tendons to the middle and ring fingers are reported to be the most commonly injured in such situations. This was a patient with multiple injuries to the extensor tendon sustained from zone 8 to zone 6. The reconstruction was done after 6 months after all the wounds had healed and the skin became soft and supple. The gap between the proximal and distal curtains of the extensors are seen, fascial atta graft harvested and attached proximally by weaving through the musculotendinous junctions and the muscles distally taken under the extensor retinaculum and split into four for the four fingers. The repair is complete after adjusting the tension and the results can be seen at the end of three months. And finally, extensor injuries at zone 9. Zone 9 injury described by Doyle represents injury to the extensor muscles in the proximal two-thirds of the forearm. So this involves mainly injury to the muscle bellies of the extensor muscles. Penetrating trauma is the most frequent cause of such injuries. It warrants an exploration which can reveal muscle injury, nerve injury or both. If the muscle alone is lacerated, it is repaired with multiple figure of eight sutures using 2-0 polyglactin or vicryl. Tendon transfers may need to be done if the muscle damage is extensive. If the nerve is injured, that is, if the posterior intraosseous nerve is injured, it must be dissected and repaired if we are going to repair the muscles also. If the nerve is not identifiable or it has been crushed beyond repair, tendon transfers are ideal. This injury involved the extensor muscles alone and the posterior intraosseous nerve was found to be intact. Hence, the muscles were repaired and acceptable extension of the wrist and fingers could be achieved. The situation of chronic presentation to extensors in zone 9 could be encountered in delayed presentation, failure of primary repair or extensive injuries involving loss of the muscles and tendons. The only treatment options available in such situations are either a tendon transfer 
or a free functioning muscle transfer using a functioning gracilis muscle. I hope you liked the video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more about other zones of extensor tendon injury and their management. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery, plastic surgery and trauma surgery. Manakkam.